hundred percent, mostly because I do have ADHD every minute of the day. Okay. <laughs> so I get to add that into the chaos of the job, but yes, I fully. Well, and then, and then today I had a moment where last week I had a family who um, they wanted a referral and I was like, I will do that for you. I will do that. Help me grow a referral. Cause I find if I do it, it gets done. And if they do it, they might do it two months later. And then today it wasn't until I stepped into that room and I saw that mom and I went, Oh, oh. shoot. I forgot to do that. You know, so little things like that, where I feel like I need to wear a notebook around my neck and be taking notes constantly because you know how if something happens at the beginning of class an hour and 15 minutes later you forget so i'm uh, i feel so unprofessional when i forget even though i sit down and i write all down all the things um it just really really frustrates me as a professional when i i'm like oops ellen i let i get like feedback from parents on what topics they want but i do um, I know Nikki shared when we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, Nikki said that she was very transparent, which I applaud her 110% for being transparent and being like, this is what you all decided. I'm not as transparent because if it, if it's all 12 to 24 month classes and they all in the top 10 picked one of those topics, I'm going to filter them all into that same week. So we'll still get to the topics that you guys want but I need a little bit of my own instructor guidance to help me. So if that's helpful, I do let them pick, but I do also, another thing too is oftentimes I get parents that wanna talk about discipline, but I'm not gonna to talk to you about discipline until we talk about feelings and emotion and social emotional development, because you can't jump to discipline without emotions first. So I do let them pick, but I also hold on to my own instructor hat because I'm the one that did all the schooling to figure out how this order is supposed to go. So if that's helpful. Yeah, um, yeah. Naomi, I'm really yeah. glad that you said that because there is a, um, uh, there's clearly there's a pedagogy in what we do, right? There's curriculum and design. And I think the, the artistry of what we do is that it's kind of, um, invisible, right? Because we can negotiate so much at one single time, right? And, um, and it looks kind of seamless when it is freaking hard. It is, you know, and then, and that's not even counting in how we're feeling that day. <laughs> and, but I really appreciate you mentioning that because it, there is a sequence of how you can talk about things. And I think it's, you know, it's not pulling out the PEC FFI or whatever framework, right? And saying, this is a curriculum design and this is how we're gonna do things. But it is also though, on the other hand, conveying to parents that, um, you know, there's a way that we can get to different topics and there's, and part of, our training, you know, on presenting topics and especially facilitating learning with adults is that um, we'll get to some topics at a certain time. And if it helps recall how their kids are, you know, like, or you take beginner French before you can learn pronouns and verbs and things like that, right? Is that there is an actual pedagogy to it because let's just face it in parenting education, you know, people don't relate to us as teachers like they would with a fifth grade teacher or with a Spanish teacher, right? And and I don't know how many of you have gotten the you're you're getting a license in parenting educate. Like, why would you need to do that? You know. So um, I really applaud any of you for somehow sort of elevating the status of your artistry as educators. Can I just share a story today, uh, kind of along this line? Um, I, I have done an interest finder. And so then I have all these things. One of the main ones is stress and balance of life. So I have a book that talks about the seasons of life and our season of parenting. And so I just decided that 
we're going to talk about this is a season, right? So we kind of approached it that way with the fall and all that kind of stuff. And um, I did it in several of my classes. Actually, I was out for two days for teapot training at the, for the pyramid model this week. Any of you that know that? Whew. Anyway, so back to what I was saying. Um, I had it as a sub lesson and then I did it in two other classes. And it just is a nice setup for you are exhausted and it makes sense. Here's why, because this is the season you're in and this is what you're going through, right? That stuff. And I have a grandma who comes to two of my classes and two in our other, other um, location. And I didn't know that that teacher was doing it this week too. So she got it three times, but today on her third class and her third time in the topic, she says, you know what? Something just hit me. She said, I just realized that in a blink of an eye, I got here to this stage and you guys, you know what? It's going to go fast. You know, she just had this lovely little aha moment. And it was after three times, same topic. So no worries. <laughs> I'm just, you got to trust it. Sometimes you have to do what you have to do for the classes and for your own sanity. When you have, I'm with you, Ellen, I've got seven classes. I've got, I'm coaching two people in teapot pyramid model, and I'm doing the teapot and I'm and then doing it in three different environments, a preschool, a daycare a center, and then ECFE. I'm like going, okay, if my boss wants me to do all this, this is what it has to be. So, and I'm doing the very best, but it was really nice to have her not say, this is the third time I heard this this week. Instead, you know, um, she said, hey, I just had an epiphany. And along with that, um, if you ever have to do that kind of thing, I also lean into the individuals and that guides the discussion and they're always different and you always kind of focus in on one little thing, a little different way. Right. So even if the, even if the information is the same, the conversation, the growth, the dialogues are different. So I trust that too, when I have to do things that look alike, I know. And I'm very transparent too, with my parents and I'll say, cause like I have parents that repeat my classes. Well, mm -hmm. My social emotional lesson and talking about feelings is pretty similar as you go through the ages. But what I tell parents is, is you've seen this before. If you've been in my class, you've seen this before. But kind of as you're saying, Greta, your child is different. Your parenting journey right now is very different. So think about it from the lens of where you're at right now in this classroom today. And how does this relate to your child now versus last year when you were sitting in my class and heard it at the same time? Yeah, I'll often preface that. I'll say, if you've been in my class before, you've heard me say, and I just, I always get kind of giddy when parents will say, Ellen, I remember when you said that before, but I forgot about that because I didn't need it for my first child, but now I need it for this child. So, yeah. Or I can just throw back some feedback as a mom who did eight years in a row of ECFE, like seriously, each time something would come up and it would be like, oh, right. Like, I knew that I should be doing that. <laughs> like, like it was always needed. It was always needed to, to have that refresher. Even if it was, I could have stood up and taught that topic. It was like, right. This is what we need to be focusing on. It was always helpful. Um, and I've been grateful this year. I've got, I was, super transparent on pretty much the first week of classes when I looked at my rosters and saw that I had um, a lot of doubles, like a lot of people who were in more than one of my classes. And I was just like, straight up, you're going to get the same lesson. You might even get the same lesson the same week. Um, and, but I said, I wanted them to notice and dive in and say, but it's going to be different because each class is a different class. And you will, when you get to see something the second time, you'll notice something you didn't see the first time, or someone else in the class will bring up a question that hadn't even occurred to you. So dive in anyway, even if you can become somewhat the expert in the group because you've already been exposed to the information. Um, and I've got two grandmas in particular who, in, who have doubled up classes and who have noted, they're like, wow, I really noticed something new. So I'm, Ellen, I am not trying to do different. Uh, it's, it's, I can't, <laughs> I can't. I'm, I'm doing like, although I'm struggling with the, like, I have, you know, a couple classes that are an hour or longer and half of them are only 45 minutes. 
And then some of the classes we've been getting new parents every week. So we are doing introductions. And so we're not really at the same place for the classes, but I'm trying to keep us kind of on the same path. I just have a question about that because I frequently think about the how sometimes topics have to be talked about multiple times because I think sometimes we hop from topic to topic to topic and I think are parents getting anything out of this when we hop from right let's say you know we hop from development to temperament um you know to potty training to sleeping and I think gosh throughout the semester we provide so much information or resources you know, knowledge whatever I feel like it's a lot to walk away from and sometimes I wish we could just slow down in them like really pick them apart and I mean I've been teaching for 10 years and I just keep thinking about this and thinking about like is there you know if we bring up a topic is there some way that we can do you know some practical training in that or giving you know we maybe we talk about a topic one week and then the next week it's all about reflection or giving them to the time to reflect because there's just so much information that is given i just as a parent myself i think i don't know what i walked away with in ecf i mean i remember little tidbits you know here and there and good information and still information that i share but I think, oh, I wish, I don't know, I guess I'm looking for the permission to just slow down, but I can't give it to myself. I don't I know how I can totally, that. How totally about we all just here. give it to you right now? <laughs> <laughs> you got it. You totally yes. have it. Um, and not only the permission to slow down and take two weeks on something instead of one or whatever your norm was, but I, you have the permission to like revisit it two months later and say, hey, remember when we were talking about this? What do you guys think now, now that we've touched on these other things? How, have you yeah. changed your thinking on that? Mm -hmm. um, I, I love, absolutely think so. Yes, I love that idea of circling back. I guess I just haven't thought about that because I just don't know how to do that in an like effortless way, just a mm -hmm. you know really natural. I mean, I guess sometimes mm -hmm. we do that. Like, oh, remember we talked about development? This is, mm -hmm. you know, we can circle back to that in resilience or, you know, mm -hmm. whatever, you know, literacy or whatever that is, but it's hard. I have done somebody asked Ellen, I think um, I have done the RD PED. Yeah, the classes and the training with Heather. Yes. And so we've used that. I've used that in some of our classes, too, which is and a so good practical oh. way. Yeah, for sure. And Megan, the other thing that's kind of nice is I try to like, sometimes I'll make lists on paper or I'll take, you know, I'll take a picture on the board. Uh, I'm sorry, I'll be writing on the whiteboard and I'll take a picture of it. And then when I want to circle back or what I do is on my iPad, I just started doing this. I will take pictures of things that I write down on the whiteboard and then I'll put it in a folder on my iPad. And when something comes back up, I'll be like, I love that you're bringing this back up because I took a picture of the last time we wrote this stuff down. So then I can pull up a photo and be like, do you remember when we talked about this? Because I think sometimes just, do you remember when we made this list? We made this list three months ago. And, you know, so I think if you write things down, you can bring them back as long as you remember to take a picture of it. <laughs> um, but I think I think just saying, do you remember back when we had that conversation? That alone is a super power, powerful, reflective piece that you can always bring back. And I don't think it needs to be effortless. I think it, I think it, it's okay for it to be really purposeful. You know what I mean? Like not effortless, but I don't think there's anything wrong with coming back and saying, this reminds me of our conversation, blah, 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 blah. You know what I mean? I, I think you just make it soup. You're just really, um, what's the word I'm looking for? You're going to be very intentional, intentional. Thank you. It's Friday. I have no words, <laughs> but, but does that make sense? So that kind of gives you more of a physical thing that you can pull back out and be like, yep, here's this. So it's something I new to try. Ellen, I also was specifically thinking of reflective dialogue because I, mm -hmm in my classes the last few weeks I did temperament and then followed by one of the really early video sets that's um, 
blocks and dinosaurs with preschoolers. <laughs> a lot of people have seen that one, but it, it's, it's, it's like very clearly different parenting styles um, and really, really different temperaments of the kids. And it was like, just talking about temperament was getting super boring. Like, okay, yeah, we get it. Um, and doing the video and getting people to see, oh, wow, what does that look like? Because the initial thought was like, well, all boys just like to knock down blocks. It's like, well, yeah, look, let's look at this next video where you can't even hear the little boy because he's whispering and he's quietly making a tree for his dinosaurs. Like, no, um, like, and, and then we could talk about how does temperament play play into how we parent and um, goodness of fit and all those wonderful things about finding a way to match your child. Um, it, so my intent throughout this year, hopefully, is, is going to be to use different pieces of reflective dialogue, not as a course in and of itself, but interspersed within the the more traditional lessons that I teach as a way of slowing down, as a way of like, okay, now I've got a picture of this in my head. Now I can, when I'm playing with my kid, remember, oh, right, temperament. My child needs me to match his energy level or whatever um, that might come up. Uh, so I'm finding it so far at the very, very beginning of the school year, a helpful tool. I've also, um, um, I, think, I think it's really easy to be very topic oriented. And that was one of the things about a lot of type of community education that is has always been bothersome to me and because it's like then how do you assess it well we assess people's gain of knowledge right so how much do they know about these things when really it's about um about skills and relationships and about the relationship to the child and the relationship to ourselves or to you know is developing as parents and so um what I've always tried to do, and I with all of my classes, is to step back and think, but really, what am I trying to do here? You know, and and if there are core concepts that sort of circling back, that's what I circle back to is is helping the learner hold that thread throughout because that's what I want them to leave with. And so if I want them to leave with intentionality as a parent, if I want them to leave with, leave with listening to their child or matching the child, that's something I can bring up all the time. Like, and so now we're on a new topic and then that's what comes out again because if they don't, because one of the things that I've also seen through many, many years is right, new research comes out, this top, this thing is, you know, now you're supposed to like, you can drink coffee, or you can't drink coffee, this is good for your heart, this isn't good for your heart, right? That kind of level of detailed knowledge that some people can like latch onto and miss the big picture. And, and so while there's that general ethic of that, I think, always remains to me the larger priority of how is the class going? How are people feeling in this class? What is the context? What is the culture? What is the climate? When they leave today, how are they going to feel, right? Because that's it sort of, Megan, when you talk about like leaving after the years in ECFE, you may not, I love that the quote, I think it's Maya Angelou. It's like, I may not remember what I heard, but I remember what I felt, right? And, um, and it, as long and, and our artistry as teachers providing that continued context. But then the secondary thing is then in our teaching, what are those primary principles of parenting that we want it, because they come out in discipline, they come out in toilet training, they come out in sleep. And if there is too much of a focus I mean, what parents want is they want knowledge. They want, they want solutions. They want problems to be solved. They want whatever, right? And those are those topics that they're coming up with. What we want is the skills in their relationships with their children and, as, and to take care of themselves <laughs> and to honor their own development. And so I do think that that's the super cool, like subtle thing that, we can continue to do like our circling back 
while we're, and there's a really good learning principle in there too, right? That repetition. So the repetition of that same thing coming back. And this is where reflective dialogue is also really good because of the technique of how did the mother feel there? How did the child feel there? Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, and again, what is the, what's the biggest benefit of doing reflective dialogue? It's leaving the person with new skills of questions they can ask themselves mm -hmm. as insight. So. Mm -hmm. So Susan, uh, I love your idea, I love your emphasis on this. You know, that make me think about, so I am a new teacher and developing a new program. So I pay a lot of attention to how, I mean, what is the effect and the effectiveness of the class. So over my last year, um, kind of uh, um, entering uh, entrance uh, experience, I noticed when I presented a lot of contents in the class, you know, parents, they, they had, they made a lot of notes, they had odd times, right? And I feel, and then gradually I, I came to this kind of feeling. So it is important to make a specific focus on one point enough so, and provide the strategy. So, the, the parent can practice during the week and during the week follow, follow the class. So, so, so they have that week to practice one thing um, on that, you know, on that topic. I feel that is uh, important in like for our, uh, as parent educator to me, I feel like I do need to design the class and make the point on one thing so they can practice because if i present like too many like even like only a three they may not be able to do that they don't they, they certainly don't don't have energy and time to do too much and i feel like you know if we we kind of come down to one thing or two and pro and let them to choose one strategy they would like to practice uh, that is that is that is you know I'm going to do for my new uh, class this fall. So I you know I'm starting in November, and that is my new plan for the for this new semester. I think when I started off teaching, I felt like I needed to cover all of these things. And then as I've progressed over the years, I've realized that covering too many things, I think Megan brought up a really good point. It's like, what are you actually taking away from this? So um, I feel fortunate though, that in my district, parents sign up for the whole year. We don't have semesters. They get charged quarter, like three times a year. So at any point a parent can drop and join. So parents might join halfway through the year and miss out on the whole first half of the content. But I also feel like too, I'm intentional about bringing back, like remember when we talked about this, you know, we talk about social emotional development in the beginning of the year. And then I typically don't get to discipline until, you know, winter ish. And we've talked about other things in between. So I can go back to that, you know, and those parents who are new but I feel like because I have a whole year with them, I don't feel the pressure of a semester. Um, and I do take three weeks to talk about social emotional development because I break it down into a lot of different pieces because you try and shove social emotional development into 45 minutes, you're gonna get nothing from it. It makes me think too about parental growth. And that was something that I've just been thinking a lot about lately. This last year in our pandemic, we've been meeting one-on-one -on -one with this family. And it's just part of it is they had signed up for a class, but then the class wasn't running. So we just started doing home visits with them. We know them very well. They've been in our program for many years. And so, and then through the pandemic, they also couldn't do in- well, when we had in-person classes, they couldn't attend because one of their children has a heart defect. So they were really worried about the coronavirus getting to them and then getting their daughter sick. And so 
we were with them for a whole year doing just one-on-one -on -one home visits through Zoom. And then this fall, we got to meet back with them. And mom and dad were, you know, asking a lot of questions that I felt we had gone over in the last year of being with them. And then it just made me think, what the hell have I been doing for the last year with you? You know, like, and then obviously there's a way something is wrong potentially with the way that I'm providing information or resources because your behavior isn't necessarily changing. So then it made me think of this whole thing about how do we measure parental growth? How do we how do we know that anything we're saying or anything we're presenting or any information that we're giving is sticking with the parents and is changing their behaviors, which has then made me think of, I, I feel like in my classes, I need to talk about, you know, the model of change, right? Like what change looks like, what stages we need to make or hit to, to change our behaviors, you know, go deeper than the content of development and temperament and nutrition and food and all that. And so now I'm just kind of struggling with that. Like I've been doing a lot of research on, you know, the model of change and, you know, how do we, there's this great little video by, um, I forget his name, is it Bruce Lipton? He does like the power of belief. And he's got this really great little video on how we can intentionally change our behavior. So I'm like, I'm going to just start there. But it's hard. It's hard to know. I guess I just, I, in this particular family, I'm like, I have talked to you about all of this stuff, all of this. And you're still reverting to A, B, and C behavior. And what, a, you know, I don't know. I'm just struggling with that right now. Anybody else ever think about that or feel that way? Okay, good. Well, and I think parents also have to be, there's a reason I don't for my multi-age class, my toddler class, I always do a week on body awareness, not so much about toilet learning, but body awareness. What are the things you can do that help your child be, you know, make a positive path to, to learning how to use the potty. Um, but in my multi-age classes, I don't do a whole week on that because if I do a week on it, unless they are ready to receive the information about learning to use a potty, they're not listening to it. And I, I, this happened two weeks, you know, one time I did it, I did it like, you know, third or fourth week, but did a whole hour on it, a whole hour, two weeks later. I know we just talked about this, but I wasn't really paying attention. Can we talk about it again? And I was like, oh my God, are you kidding me? But she wasn't She's like, her child was showing zero signs. And then suddenly she was, and then suddenly it was interesting. So I always have to remind myself, like if they're not in that right zone, and if you take Heather's class, she has, she spends a whole week um, of the class on zones of development and where families are able to learn. And it, it's really real. And she has a bunch of things you can print. Um, and it's really helpful because I know I feel that all the time. And then today I had a baby class and she's like, do I have to feed her solids now? Like, I feel like, I feel like I don't want to do that yet. And I forgot how to start solids. Like, and it was like, you had a baby two years ago. So just to make you feel better, that happens to me daily. Well, and I, I, I think Ellen, that's a great example that can go across some of the questions, Megan, you were asking is it's really, really challenging to evaluate parenting. It, I mean, where do you even begin? That's the, I mean, then to know if you've done it <laughs> and then to know if there's growth in it, it's very complicated. And so I think you're asking awesome questions, but have to have a lot of grace for yourself. Cause I don't think the field is fully ready or even, I don't know if it will be capable of fully saying, like my teapot model, it is fidelity. I am right there. I can say this is fidelity to that program, but I can't do that for parenting. It's so, and to measure individual's growth. Um, those, those are some of the reasons why I think we do some of the self, you know, self um, 
evaluations, right? Self-evaluative pieces for parents. Where we have you, where, did, how did you come in? What is some, what have you gained? What have you implemented? Is there anything that really sticks out? I think um, your questions are amazing. I feel like I've been there at times too. Um, and then I, it's like that pendulum. Then I swinged over to like, even what you were saying, Susan, then I'm back to, well, whatever is good in the sense of it's not the topic because that changes. I could eat eggs this year, but not next year. And, you know, that sort of thing. It, it swings over to that sort of side. And then it's back over to this, but, 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 but here's the concrete. We know that parents are doing better when da, 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 da. And I know that, and I try to not swing so far and not too fast. How's that? <laughs> I just try to and exhale. I love what you're saying. Sometimes we've done like um, topical, if there's a topic that you really want a fam families to get going into a topical based class where you can take five weeks or like kind of like a book study, kind of like that, sometimes is a practical step. If there's something that you're really wanting them to really gain hold of, um, that's one when you were saying earlier, what's something we can do to slow it down. Sometimes we can slow it down by making a class specific. That sometimes is helpful. Um, I for sure think slowing it down and giving yourself permission to take the pace you need. And I am envious of Naomi of your program in some regards because you have a long year and you can get to those. I mean, when I, you can get to those topics where it's like, when am I ever gonna go to get to will writing in this little thing that I have here that was given to me or, you know, um, different, topics that we never get to because I'm always doing the same ones it feels like right in some ways when you have a some when you only have a semester and then you have to restart it kind of again mm -hmm. people I don't know Naomi you have a good I'm going to stop talking I don't know no, I just I think too though um one of the things that I am fortunate to also have with my role in this district is the fact that I have hours set aside that are considered outreach hours and, you know, pre-pandemic, we were bringing ECFE into the community and we were setting up classrooms in libraries and in apartment, you know, room, like the party rooms of apartments. And it took a lot of time. It was a lot of work, but it was awesome and it was fun. But, a, you know, pandemic, we can't go to those places right now. So one of the things that we have done is I offer online parent-specific topics and they change from week to week. So unfortunately, Yuji was gonna observe me this last couple of weeks, but no one's signing up for them because it's the beginning of the year and everybody's a little Zoom fatigued. But I have at least once a month, if not twice a month, a potty training hour and a half class where we might've talked about it in class, but if you weren't ready for it then, and now you're ready for it, this is an offering, you can come listen. Or if you're ready for it now, and we're not going to talk about it until, you know, March, because 90% of the class is between 12 months and 16 months. And I'm not going to talk about it till we're all closer to two, because it's not worth my time. But your child is older. I'm like, come on in, come get the information now. So some of those topics I do just offer throughout the year. So that's your way that. about that. We, we do that too. We, we call it parent focus and we invite, invite families birth through third grade. And we have a specific topic each month that we talk about for what you're saying, if parents are there, but we know we're not going to get to that particular topic until whenever we, I think like many of you, we have classes that are offered by semester. So we go September to December and then January to May. And so most of our families, I don't have the exact number, but it's pretty high, like I would say 80% of our families return come January, but they do have to register. And some prior to the pandemic, we had a lot of full classes. So families would have to go back on a waiting list. And so that was hard, you know, to, to do that. 
we're not as, um, our, our classes aren't as full right now. Uh, so I think it'll be easier for families to come back in January, I think families won't have a problem getting back in. But that's hard too, because then you start a new semester with potential new families, but then old families too. So like, well, I've already done all kind of that first semester topic. And now we need to, I would like to move on to, I think Greta, what you were saying, like, I like to talk about grief and, you know, death, because I, we should have a plan about that and how we should talk to our children before we're actually in maybe grief and grief and death you know, so we can help our families or, you know, whatever of those topics that we necessarily can't get to first semester. But it's hard because then parents who are just coming in January miss all kind of the foundational classes is what I call those. Susan, I want you to answer that question that you posed to us. Like, I have no idea. <laughs> like you give me an answer to that. Oh, the one on um, how do we know the parents are growing? Yes. And like, one comes from an abusive background and one comes from like a clear oh. cultural lens and one who's 15 and one who has five right. children. In life. Right. And this is the challenge, right? I mean, this is why um, the observations of our field are so infuriating to me because they, re it, it's so reductive when we know that it is anything but and that the job, the role of parenting is so hard and complex and different, depending on circumstances that people bring to it. Um, Jay Belsky's multi-determinants model is one that I have always used in my own work because it, for the first time, oftentimes a uh, parent, it's, it's like, parenting leads to these children's outcomes, right? And it's just like, but Belsky's work was the first one that really added the parent's own development as a contribution to parenting, right? Mm -hmm. and, and looked at the three dimensions of the parent's own developmental history, as well as the differences with children, children's temperament, children's ages, number of children, whatever, and then the social context and the degree of social support, right? And, and even that is pretty simple, but it's, um, and, um, but at least it brought parents into the equation and the differences of parents into the equation. And um, I think it's a near impossibility um, except on an individual, I think it, it depends. It depends. This is why, and I hate to sound researchy, but it's like the easiest thing is how do you define growth, right? You always start at the other side, which is as whatever matters to you. And oftentimes we don't have that luxury because we're in systems that define it for us and want us to demonstrate children's learning and development or whatever, right? Happy families. And so, but if it's up to us, then I think it's up to us as, 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 as educators, like we define what parental growth is. And we also know that that timetable is highly, highly variable to that endpoint. And, and I think that we're also gentle when we think of our own growth and development. And I'll take myself as an example. I am horrible on investments <laughs> and IRAs and, and you know um, bond funds and ETFs and things like that, and it infuriates my husband because you know he wants everything. He wants to have you know, and you can tell me once, and you can tell me five years later, and you can tell me again fifteen years later. And unless I really care, I mean, this is the whole thing about you know how many people does it take to screw in a light bulb? You know, it's just like only one, but they have to really want to, you know, and. And so there is a, this is why education psychology is so interesting, right? Because there's so, there, there's so many variables in how do you teach, who do you teach? I love the research that's, that shows it's not the content, it's the instructor, right? It's the presence of the instructor that makes more of a difference or you have 15 different curricula that have been validated and have been tested and have fidelity and over and over and over, they show the same results. When those 15, what really mattered to eventual learning by individuals was who delivered it, who the instructor was, 
how much the instructor really read the room, knows their learners, you know? So Susan, can I just, Susan, can I just say, I wanted to yeah, tell you, to May, I wanted to say this to Megan when you were talking about that family, Megan, you have no idea in the previous year before the home visits, what your connection and relationship with them had done, even if they didn't take on the skills. You, we don't know what that one conversation did in that chat, that parent's day, their moment, right? The, so, and I think that we can't underestimate our relationships with these families and what that does. We, I don't know how to measure that. Um, we can say it feels good. I, it, it left me in tears. I, what, I mean, whatever it might be, but I want to just give you kudos that you don't, even if they didn't take the skills, you don't know what that was, um, how that impacted their lives. Because we can't go back and say, what if this road had been traveled instead of that road? Or they tried it for three days and it worked for three days and it got them through the hardest time in their moments, right? For that child at two and a half. And now they're not using it, but maybe they did. We, we, we just don't, I don't know. Kudos. Yeah, I found, I run into people when they're done, they've graduated from ECFE and I run into them at the store and they're like, oh, I wish there was ECFE for fourth grade. And then I, and I'm like, come to my, come to this class. We have a, an after an elementary parent chat. It's not very popular, but um, anyway, but they'll say something to me like, gosh, I just, I remember being going home with two new tools in my toolbox and this direct quote from a mom who said, I, I don't have any tools in my toolbox for my 10 year old. And I wish there was an ECFE class because every time I went home from ECFE, I felt like I had tools in my toolbox to try. Um, and so, but it's on, sometimes they don't get until like way later on. And they're like, gosh, I didn't realize just how much support I had each week until they're gone. Um, and I will still have parents say, sometimes Ellen, I still hear you in the back of my head. I still hear you, you know, and their kids are seven and eight. So I'm like, <laughs> I'm infiltrating. Um, but yeah, you really just, you just really don't know until you just don't know. I'm trying to find an article about building cathedrals. Have you guys ever read the story about the cathedral builder and how the cathedral builder will never see the finished project? I'm going to try to find it because I feel like it's super applicable to this conversation. I will find it. I have <laughs> always, oh, sorry. Go ahead, I, I was just saying, I, I just kind of had that aha moment of the fact that they asked us to come back in a home visit, I guess, is, and they've accepted us into their home. Like we are going to their home outside until the weather gets cold and then we'll come into the building. But the fact that they were excited for us to come back and they said yes. And I mean, they're very, very kind and they always are like we're so lucky to have you and we feel you know really grateful so i mean i guess those are indicators huge oh. indicators yeah like and i've always been struck in parent ed how on a different scale what we're doing with parents is what we're wanting them to do with their children right and you don't get to see it like you don't um one of my parents I know I mentioned this last week just said she wouldn't know if she was a good parent until her child was grown up um now hopefully we get some indicators before then right but but so much of what we're trying to do with parents is exactly what they're trying to do with their children and when we talk about you know, relationship being that base of the pyramid, right? Like that you have to have that first. If you are building meaningful relationship with the parents and families that you work with, you have already set the foundation. Like you've allowed no, no meaningful, this is the quote, right? No meaningful learning comes without meaningful relationship, right? So when you are doing that, you've, you've really set the stage for, no, they might not remember the exact advice you gave them. There's too much to keep going on up there, right? But they remembered that they could ask you and that you knew, and you've got this going back and forth. And I know for me and for so many parents I work with that it's much more about the overarching feeling of not being alone, feeling of support, feeling of a place where you could share your struggles and successes. Like that 
that is to me like what ECFE is all about. It's not about if if they remember the specific bullet points of your of your lesson plan. Um, and it's the same as when we're teaching kids, you have to do it over and over and over and over again. So you will have that. What have we been doing for the last year? You will have that with families because they won't remember. There's just too many other things competing for their attention. Um, but they'll know that they can ask you. Something I'm playing with in a couple of my classes right now is um, to have them write out like joys and concerns and um, something they wish they knew in parenting. But uh, another question that you just made me think of is kind of um, what's your hot topic right now or what is um, a, a, a personal like parent growth for myself, um, but just writing four or five things down, keeping those and having them do it again in three months or in nine months and, and use it as a way to like, let them see themselves that, oh, they actually do have different concerns now and their joys have grown and their hot topic is totally different. Um, so like, I think that could be a useful tool is having you know, each class have something that you hang on to and then bring back again. And I do see families multiple years in a row. And so some of those you can really go back um, over time, which would be kind of just a fun thing to do. I know I tried to remind myself once in a while, they didn't sign up for a class at the U of M. They signed up for a parent education class through community ed on a Tuesday morning because their other child's in preschool. <laughs> I mean, sometimes I just need to remind myself of that framework too. Mm -hmm. I want them to know all of the different areas of temperament and I want them to know how their child exact, you know, but yeah. Well, and remember exactly, Greta, as you're saying, I mean, the, like the very first thing I heard about ECFE when I moved into the state was that the majority of parents go to ECFE because they want their kids to have socialization, right? When they're two or three years old. And it's sort of like, come to ECFE for your kids, stay for yourself. And so if they come into an atmosphere that is preachy or lecture, because that's the other thing, right? Is the other great thing about your artistry is that you, you keep them, right? And because there is such a stigma, I think of all the parents who don't go because they're thinking the stigma of going in there and being told they're bad parents and they're not doing good enough. And, you know, especially with social media and their kids are dirty and they're not in clean clothes all the time and they're not happy and all of those things. And then what to go into ECFE and be told, yes, you are not a good parent, right? This is all their fears. So they come for their kids and then they're greeted with this wonderful atmosphere of warmth and trust and support and problem solving with each other and facilitating as a group. You know, I mean, the fact that they are coming back, um, Megan, I think that again, I've put a couple things in the note as you've talked, but um, it is huge. I mean, because also, I also think of like Dan Siegel stuff about parents with trick, you know, like the brain thing, right? And the four year old, the dad with the four year old who is triggered. And, you know, the kid is just pressing his button and he's going to react. Well, that dad has come from such a history that did not prepare him to love himself, let alone, you know, be a parent. And so when we talk about looking at growth or you think of the development of a teenage parent, right, all the things that they're not ready to do yet. And if you can give them that atmosphere of love and support and openness and that kind of thing, you will see change because if they, as they come back, that dad is going to be less angry and it's less about him and less about how that kid is pissing him off and much more about the good feeling he has being with his son or that he, he, because he hates himself for it or whatever. So yeah, again, I think that it, it really does, it comes down to how we, because you can measure it, right? You can measure change, you can measure growth, you can, you know, you just have to define it, but it's going to vary so much depending on your population. So again, you guys are just so amazing. And I would hate for you to um, not think 
that your parents aren't growing in your, even if the parent doesn't come back, right? The seed that you've planted, they may come back for the next kid. You know, it may not be a good time. And also don't take their behavior of lack of attendance or whatever. That's just where they are at that point. It has less to do with you and much more about their life at that time, right? I, so I cannot count the number of times where I've in my career have thought, oh, shoot, I just messed that up. And then I get a note from them or an email or I contact them on the phone or something. Oh, our schedule changed. I had to take on a new job, my job. So I'm not able to come in. I'm like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> we put so much on us, right? And I'm like, oh, OK, it wasn't because of us. I mean, surely there may be some that come because there was something that happened at ECFE at some point in time. But be gracious on yourself, right, for sure. It just, it makes me think of some, or not makes me think of something, something that we, Britta and I have um, after this is that we are meeting with the district to try to get parent ed in birth through 12th grade. Like for 10 years, I've been planting the seed and our superintendents were totally sick of me. But I have just been writing and, and this summer we got, or this last year, we got a new superintendent. So I've just been filling her ear. And now today we have a meeting with them to move forward on how we can get parent education because I have had so many families who have said, I have had ECFE with parent support, birth through five years old. Now my child is going to kindergarten and I have nothing. And so I think, especially in this last year and a half, parents really need support. And I think they need just to come together for collective wisdom. 